Sunday at 8 on 4. Now on 4, a sequel to the award-winning Sri Lanka's Killing Fields as Jon Snow again investigates the brutal conclusion of the Sri Lankan civil war with disturbing and distressing descriptions and footage of the shelling of civilians, executions and atrocities. Sri Lanka's Killing Fields, war crimes unpunished. Last year, Channel 4 made a film which contained some of the most shocking images we have ever broadcast. They were filmed in 2009, in the final stages of the civil war between the government of Sri Lanka and the rebel forces of the Tamil Tigers, or LTTE. During that period, according to United Nations sources, government forces killed up to 40,000 civilians. Others say many more. Our film presented evidence of atrocities by both sides. But its most disturbing finding was of a series of war crimes perpetrated by victorious Sri Lankan government forces. These included the shelling of civilians and hospitals in what were supposed to be no fire zones. And evidence, too, of sexual assaults on female fighters. It also presented evidence of the systematic execution of bound prisoners. The film was shown to world leaders and diplomats at special screenings from Geneva to New York and was broadcast on television stations around the world. It was an extremely powerful program uh, and it refers to some very worrying events and we need to make sure we get to the bottom of what happened. It was raised in the Australian Senate. Serious allegations of war crimes broadcast so vividly and disturbingly on Channel 4. It even provoked a remarkable televised statement from the former Sri Lankan president Chandrika Bandaranaika Kumaratunga. Sobbing on the phone to say how ashamed he was to call himself a Sinhalese and Lankan after seeing the killing fields of Sri Lanka. Our film showed both specific evidence of war crimes and the terrible suffering of a people who had been failed by the international community. It ended with a question, would those people now get justice? Would the war crimes committed against them be investigated and those responsible brought to account? So far, that has not happened. So in this follow-up film, we present new evidence of war crimes and investigate who was responsible, an investigation which points to the highest levels of the Sri Lankan government. The Tamil Tigers were a brutal but effective army fighting for the creation of an independent state of Tamil Elam, a war in which they were prepared to use conscription, child soldiers, and even, as in this attempt to kill a government minister, suicide bombers. In our first film, we recorded how in the final months government forces drove the Tigers and hundreds of thousands of Tamil civilians into an ever smaller area in the northeast, the killing fields of Sri Lanka. The government had one aim above all others. There'd been a murderous, terrible 26 year civil war. And come hell or high water, they were going to eliminate the LTTE as a potential terrorist uh, force. They were not going to let anybody stop them do that, either the international community, the media, uh, or the fear of uh, humanitarian issues or civilian casualties. That's the way it worked out. The people in charge of this operation, who today remain the two most powerful men in Sri Lanka, were the Defence Minister, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, and his brother, the President, Mahinda. It was they who oversaw the war, and they who rejected all calls for an international investigation into the allegations of war crimes. It is not for outsiders to impose their values or their judgments on Sri Lanka. Instead, 
they insisted that they were conducting their own inquiry, ordered by the president himself. It was called the Lessons Learnt and Reconciliation Commission, or the LLRC. And this, they said, would be enough to answer the allegations. At the end of last year, the LLRC report was finally published. This is it. It concedes that a considerable number of civilians died, a fact denied until now by the government. It also expresses concern over several issues, including the large number of Tamils detained, who have since disappeared. But its most remarkable feature is what it omits. It fails to properly address the extensive evidence of war crimes by government forces, and it specifically denies that any civilians were knowingly targeted. As a result, it fails to identify anyone responsible. So in this film, we shall focus on four specific case histories. In each case, we present new evidence of war crimes and demonstrate that ultimate responsibility for those crimes lies at the very top of the Sri Lankan army and government. Our first case begins on the 23rd of January 2009, when UN personnel from the last overland food convoy into the war zone became trapped by the fighting. The Sri Lankan government had declared what they called a no-fire zone, the first of the war, and hundreds of thousands of civilians fled into it, hoping for safety from the growing ferocity of the government versus tigers conflict. The UN convoy, led by two international staff members, including an Australian called Peter Mackay, seen here in the blue T-shirt, set up base near a temporary hospital in an area known as Udiakatu, inside the no-fire zone. With the help of nearby civilians, they dug bunkers as a hub for the UN operation. As was standard procedure, Mackay plotted the precise GPS coordinates of the UN site and these were forwarded to the Sri Lankan government forces by the United Nations. Despite that, it was fired on. Over the next few days, a barrage of shells rained down in the no-fire zone. several landing directly on or near the UN distribution hub. The UN workers themselves photographed the resultant carnage. Among the dead were innocent civilians who had helped them dig the bunkers. We showed these photographs to a forensic pathologist. These particular photographs show very dramatic injuries. Uh, uh, one man with half his face uh, torn away. Another man essentially decapitated with fragments of the head li lying about. And then a woman uh, with a child. So the these are the kinds of injuries that to result from shrapnel. So you're talking about explosions and pieces of flying metal and debris. So it would be consistent with shelling? Yes, it would be consistent with shelling. There's nothing here that says that this wasn't due to shelling. But the key question is where did the shelling come from? Government spokesman Brigadier Udaya Nanayakara denied government responsibility, blaming Tamil Tigers who sometimes did have units adjacent to the civilians. But a confidential internal UN report records that their staff in the field were in no doubt where the shelling was coming from. The probability of shell fire originating from government of Sri Lanka forces is considered 100%. There is further evidence to confirm that. As the shells rained down on Udiakatu, UN workers made frantic calls from the no-fire zone to the Australian High Commissioner and UN officials in Colombo, asking for the shelling to stop. The UN workers were told these requests were passed on directly both to Army Commander Sarath Fonseca and Defence Minister Gotabaya Rajapaksa. Shortly after these calls, the shelling shifted slightly away from the UN bunkers, but it continued to rain down on the no-fire zone. In a sworn statement dealing with the incident, Peter Mackay describes how the shelling was retargeted. Now the closest shells landed 100 metres from us, 
indicating that they could control the fire when they wanted to. This is of particular significance. It suggests the defense minister and the army commander had now at least direct knowledge of the shelling of the no-fire zone. It was ordered away from the actual UN bunkers, but there was no end to the shelling of the no-fire zone. It also suggests the attacks, killing civilians, were accurately targeted. I think that's a very damning indication because uh, we know then that at the highest levels of government and military in Sri Lanka that they were aware of the attack and the military activities were then adjusted clearly in response to this. Do you think that on the basis of that evidence we have so far, Gotabaya Rajapaksa and South Fonseca have questions to answer? There's no doubt that they have questions to answer and that if that episode is properly studied and if the, the presumptions are borne out by more evidence, we're talking about the possibility of criminal charges. Throughout the war, the Sri Lankan government continued to insist it had a policy of zero civilian casualties. But weeks of government shelling eventually forced the Tamil civilians to flee the no-fire zone. Then on the 12th of February, the government declared a new, smaller no-fire zone on a long sand spit to the north. Some 300,000 civilians would set up camp here. Life on this coastal spit was increasingly brutal, the shelling relentless, but the evidence suggests that something else happened here. In our second case history, we examine evidence of another significant and sustained war crime by the Sri Lankan government the deliberate denial of food and medicine to hundreds of thousands of trapped civilians. And as the effects of the food shortages grew ever worse, another shortage became critical. In the makeshift hospitals, medicines were in desperately short supply too. Even government appointed doctors trapped in the no fire zone began complaining about the situation, saying their appeals for more supplies were being deliberately ignored. And see, there are all IC patients, emergency patients. We don't have an antibiotic and drug source. So we several times inform our government, but government not willing to send any medicine here. Yet allowing adequate humanitarian aid into a war zone is a legal obligation. So how did the government justify limiting the supplies? New evidence suggests they did it by deliberately downplaying the number of civilian refugees requiring food and medical aid in the no-fire zone. In April 2009, an internal cable from the US Embassy in Colombo, one of a massive trawl of confidential US diplomatic documents obtained by the website WikiLeaks, says, Sri Lankan government estimates of civilians remaining under LTTE control over the past several weeks were about 60,000. In fact, as the United Nations and the United States knew from satellite and other intelligence, the real figure was in the hundreds of thousands. The Sri Lankan government had their own drones and satellites and would have known that too. The effect of this underestimate on the trapped civilians was devastating. It takes 30 tons of food to feed 60,000 people for a day. Now, we know there was anything from two to 300,000 people in the zone during the month of April. And between April the 1st and April the 27th, only 60 tons were delivered. So across that whole period of nearly four weeks, you had enough food delivered to feed 60,000 people for two days, not 300,000 people for a month. That is the scale of the humanitarian emergency that existed 
And so the responsibility for that goes directly back to the government in Colombo. And even as some civilians managed to flee from the no-fire zone, the Sri Lankan government continued to play down the numbers of trapped refugees. UN figures reveal that by the end of April, well over 125,000 remained trapped in the zone. But this was President Rajapaksa's estimate given to CNN on April the 28th. We are sending the supplies. That's why we want to finish this as soon as possible and get the people into our side because there are only about 5,000, 5,000 to say even 10,000 as they say. It was a vast underestimate. The president himself had now endorsed the rigged figures which were being used to justify the denial of adequate humanitarian supplies. The UN's special panel of experts on Sri Lanka, which examined the evidence, is clear about what happened. The government systematically deprived people in the conflict zone of humanitarian aid, food and medical supplies, particularly surgical supplies adding to their suffering. To this end, it purposefully underestimated the number of civilians who remained in the conflict zone. International law bans medieval sieges. You, you can't subject a population to hunger or famine or plague uh, as a means of military victory. A big part of international law, of international criminal law, is getting the perpetrators who sit in the offices and, uh, and write the, the emails and, and give the orders. If they're involved in contributing to acts that amount to attacks on civilians or depriving civilians of, uh, of things that are necessary for their survival in a conflict, they are participating um, in a significant manner in the commission of war crimes. <laughs> As the final few weeks of the war played out, more key events would demonstrate only too clearly that government involvement in the commission of war crimes was far from over. They trust us and might tell us things that they wouldn't normally tell other people. It's something I'm born with. Makes you so different. To you, it's just normal. It's how you think. Will you marry me? Oh. We do an extremely hard job and we get older people that nobody else wants to do with. It doesn't matter how many times the kids get it wrong, you've got to help them get it right. We're not here to judge, you have to be professional at all times. I'm always in awe of the human body, what destruction can be put on parts of your body and how you can heal and overcome it. Documentaries for Our Time, only on Channel 4. With disturbing and distressing descriptions and footage of the shelling of civilians, executions and atrocities, we return to Sri Lanka's killing fields, war crimes unpunished. By mid-April 2009, government shelling and food shortages were making life in this crowded encampment in Putamatalan in no-fire zone number two increasingly unbearable. It was to get much worse. At 1 a.m. on the 20th of April, the Sri Lankan army, using heavy weapons and land forces, launched a massive assault on Putamatalan. Amid horrific scenes of chaos, a temporary hospital was shelled and hundreds of civilians killed. And so began the events we examine in case history number three. The Sri Lankan government officially claimed this was a hostage rescue operation. In fact, it amounted to a full-scale military assault on and into a no-fire zone where the government had told thousands of civilians to gather for their own safety. Knowingly targeting civilians is a war crime. We analyze evidence that this not only took place, but that it was sanctioned at the highest levels of the Sri Lankan military leadership. As the assault continued, the wounded, who could be moved, were loaded onto trucks and tractors 
and taken to another improvised hospital further into the no-fire zone. Many of them died en route from their injuries and uncontrolled bleeding. Amid the panic and confusion, it slowly became clear what had happened. Government forces had blasted a line right through the zone and taken control of the land to the west. With the zone split in two, civilians on the Tamil Tiger-held side fled away from the government forces and further into what was left of the no-fire zone. Artillery shelling and air attacks continued through the day. Death came often and without warning. To the east, in the area now held by the government, as many as 100,000 people struggled to escape what was once the no-fire zone. Those who could waded through lagoon waters. Many were injured and malnourished. A father desperately pleads for help for his injured child. They were rounded up and loaded onto buses to be taken to huge detention camps. The father is still holding the body of his child, now dead. <laughs> An official military spokesman insisted on the 22nd of April, as the government did throughout the war, that no heavy weapons had been used. During this uh, rescue operation, as I said earlier, we never use any of the heavy weapons and tanks. And despite all the evidence, pro-government media suggested that no civilians had died in the offensive. Troops engaged in the one humanitarian operations are believed to have rescued all civilians held hostage by the LTTE from Pudumatalan to Ambala and Pukkane in the no-war zone. Troops have refrained from attacking the areas where civilians are held hostage by the brutal LTTE. The fact that the LTTE were using civilians as human shields, which in some cases they were, which is itself a war crime, doesn't justify the shelling of those sites and those individuals. Democratic governments are held to higher standards than terrorist organizations, and they needed to be adhered to. The Sri Lankan Defence Ministry website paints it as a clinical rescue mission, but UN and other independent estimates suggest it cost as many as 1,500 lives. The evidence that's available right now uh, strongly suggests that uh, war crimes occurred, uh, potentially crimes against humanity. There has to be a proper investigation, and if crimes have been committed, the perpetrators have to be brought to justice. So who was in charge in Putamatalan? The attack from the west was carried out by the 55th Division under the command of Brigadier Prasanna de Silva. The frontal assault was carried out by the 58th Division under the command of General Shivendra Silva, here interviewed at the scene of the assault. We have been very successful, and we could say this is one of the most successful hostage uh, rescue missions that we have done. The report from the Lessons Learnt and Reconciliation Commission accepted that there had been civilian deaths as a result of the military incursion and said that they were due to crossfire and that the army's fire had been proportional and justified. But independent observers say the evidence suggests it was a potential war crime. There are strong presumptions um, when these attacks took place that they were disproportionate, that Civilians may have been, or civilian objects like hospitals, may have been targeted. The way to get to the bottom of it, of course, is with a, is with a robust inquiry that involves very rigorous uh, cross-examination and demanding of, uh, of the leaders that they give proper accounts. The key question facing any proper investigation is who ordered the offensive? Just how high does the responsibility go? President Rajapaksa was the highest military official in the country. He was the commander-in-chief, and uh, that is how he portrayed himself. Defense Secretary Gotabaya Rajapaksa has also uh, proudly proclaimed how involved he was in the military strategy.
There is absolutely every reason to question those two as to specific incidents. There is every reason to establish exactly what the chain of command was for uh, especially events in the final stages, the final few weeks in particular of the war, which were very bloody and predictably bloody. Over the next few weeks, as the heavy shelling and constant bombardment created ever greater carnage in the no-fire zone, the denials from the very top of the government became ever more emphatic. We have obtained this confidential internal UN analysis of satellite imagery backed by maps from the UN experts panel, which indicate they did use such weapons and they did target them on the no-fire zones. A time series analysis of multiple artillery batteries clearly indicated that the Sri Lankan army repeatedly rotated the fire bearing of heavy caliber howitzers to warn no fire zone two and later no fire zone three. The Sri Lankan army erected mortar batteries without viable military targets except for locations clearly falling within no fire zone two and later no fire zone three. On the 8th of May, in the final fortnight of the war, the no-fire zone was reduced to a tiny area just one mile across. This was the third no-fire zone of the war and the last. The newly leaked US cables record that the Americans tried again to suggest a ceasefire on the 17th of May. Situation report 74. Ambassador spoke to Gotabaya Rajapaksa, asking him to allow the International Committee of the Red Cross into the conflict zone to mediate a surrender. Rajapaksa commented, we are beyond that now. At the same time, the hospitals, which had again been shelled, were overwhelmed with the dead and the dying. But no outside help was to arrive. As the US cables reveal, the president's office continued to refuse access to the Red Cross. Situation Report 74. Ambassador again requested access for the International Committee of the Red Cross to the area to evacuate the wounded. The request was energetically refused. The government said the Red Cross had failed to rescue people on recent occasions and so now government forces would do it themselves. But this man says he saw how that rescue operation worked in practice. He was hiding with serious injuries in a bunker as the government troops arrived. As the troops advanced, another pattern of killing started to develop. Perhaps the most iconic images of war crimes from our first film were the videos showing the cold-blooded execution of naked and bound LTTE fighters by Sri Lankan soldiers, first broadcast by Channel 4 News. We also showed footage suggesting sexual violence against female Tamil Tigers, including the LTTE television presenter Isia Priya. Most of the footage came from soldiers within the Sri Lankan army itself. Trophy videos filmed on cameras and mobile phones. These have been authenticated both by our independent video experts and a forensic pathologist, as well as by separate teams of experts employed by the United Nations. The Sri Lankan government has continued to dismiss them as fake. And when the LLRC came to examine the videos and the allegations of extrajudicial executions, it avoided reaching a conclusion.
Instead, it suggested yet another inquiry. Last month, in something of a volte farce, the army agreed to mount such an inquiry, both to look at the issues raised by the LLRC and the allegations made in our last film. However, the inquiry is to be run by the army itself rather than an independent body. And the key question is, will it investigate who knew of and who sanctioned these executions? Because our fourth case history contains new evidence of executions and suggests responsibility goes to the top of the Sri Lankan chain of command. We have obtained this new chilling video footage in which at least one of the victims can be clearly identified. He is the 12-year-old son of the supreme leader of the Tamil Tigers, Vilupilai Prabhakaran. This footage too has been carefully examined for authenticity by leading independent experts. So this is an execution scene with five men dead and a, a young boy. The five men, their arms are behind their backs, they're freshly dead. They look as if they've been tied, but there's no ties visible except in the last man whom we see. And this is the same pattern uh, that we see in the other footage where uh, prisoners are tied with their hands behind their back, blindfolded, knelt on the ground and then shot. It is the story of the 12-year-old boy, Balakandran Prabhakaran, which best illustrates the apparently cold-blooded nature of these shootings. We've obtained a sworn affidavit from a senior Sri Lankan officer. He suggests that the boy was apparently interrogated about his father's whereabouts and then killed. He had been sent with five escorts to surrender. I got to know at the latter stages that they found out where Prabhakaran is through his son and subsequently I got to know they had been killed. Evidence that the shooting of the 12-year-old boy was an execution rather than a combat injury can be seen in these high-resolution photographs of the dead body. So he has five gunshot wounds here, here, here and then two gunshot wounds here. This was likely the first shot fired. It looks dirty because there's soot around it and there's a speckling from propellant tattooing indicating that the distance of the muzzle of the weapon to this boy's chest was two to three feet or less. So he could have reached out with his hand and touched the gun that killed him. After receiving this wound, he would have fallen backwards and it's then that he's likely to receive, have received these two wounds. They're grazed at their lower edges, indicating that the bullet is passing upwards in the body. And we can see at the top of his left shoulder what's almost certainly an exit wound. So it's likely that the shooter was standing over him when he was lying flat on the ground after the first shot at his feet, firing upwards. So this is a, this is a homicide, this is a murder, there's no doubt about it. Is there any evidence that this child was tortured? Because clearly they were trying to get information out of him about where his father was. There's no evidence on the body of physical torture. But of course, uh, if we can imagine the situation he was in, we have five dead males alongside him uh, who may well have been killed before he was killed. We have no evidence that he was blindfolded, and he's been shot by someone standing in front of him with the end of the gun within a few feet of his body. So that would be uh, psychological torture in itself. This is a war crime. This is a crime, an ordinary crime, but in particular it's a war crime under the circumstances. So what one would expect, of course, is that it would be thoroughly investigated. So far, no such investigation has taken place. Isn't it obvious what we're seeing in Sri Lanka? Uh, it's a cover-up. It's an attempt to deny that these things took, took place. The next day, the death of the boy's father, Prabhakaran himself, was confirmed and his body was shown on television, his head covered by a cloth. Unofficial footage we have obtained reveals a head wound and military medics apparently taking crude samples from his brain. A separate series of stills shows Prabhakaran's body, first in uniform, then naked, then smeared in mud. But it is the head wound which is of most significance. This would be very typical of a high-velocity gunshot wound to the head where we're looking at uh, an exit area at the front and therefore, not seen in the photograph, uh, presumably an entry wound to the back of the head.
So a single gunshot wound to the head is, is a little unusual in, in, in terms of an armed conflict, in, in terms of a shootout, if you like. Then it would suggest that perhaps uh, uh, it, was, it was a targeted shot at a, at a subject who wasn't moving. A senior commander who's responsible for troops who carry out summary executions, who fails either to prevent them, knowing that they were likely to take place, or to punish them after they've taken place, is uh, himself uh, liable to prosecution for the war crimes as a, an, in a sense, a participant in that crime. But the evidence we have revealed, both in this film and our last one, suggests an even more direct command responsibility. The binding of hands, the removal of clothing, the shots to the back of the head, all tend to suggest these were part of a systematic policy of executing many captured or surrendering LTTE members. It's obviously a more heinous crime and more serious if we can demonstrate that this was actually directed and, and, uh, and controlled and ordered at the top and not merely tolerated. When you have senior leaders who claim that they were very much in control, once you then establish that there's a, that there's a pattern, that there's a system, and that the perpetrators at the lower levels were actually carrying these things out, then the, the, the legal difficulties of, of linking the, the top to the bottom um, are, are, are largely eliminated. With Prabhakaran dead, combat operations finally ended on the 19th of May 2009. Bodies were cleared from the battlefield, including many showing signs of execution or sexual assault. On the beach, the victorious Sri Lankan army fired celebratory barrages from the heavy weapons they'd always denied using. It was a triumphant gesture of defiance to the rest of the world and marked the destruction of the Tamil Tigers as a fighting force. The war was over, but as we've shown, the evidence of war crimes continues to emerge. The Sri Lankan government response has been a massive international propaganda campaign and a ruthless drive to stamp out any sign of dissent. It was possible that we might not return. Sunday at 8, the mission that changed the course of the war in the Falklands. The target, an airstrip on an island 8,000 miles away. We had about a 40% chance of success. The crew, airmen with no experience of this type of bombing raid. Our initial thought was, oh, fancy us being involved. The equipment, one of the oldest bombers in the RAF's fleet. Wheels, pulleys, bits of bicycle chain. What can possibly go wrong? A very British kind of mission. Monty Python couldn't have done it any better. The remarkable true story of the most audacious bombing raid since the Dambusters. Falkland's most daring raid. Sunday at 8 on 4. This is a dream for a dealer. Ordinary objects. I'd love to buy it. Extraordinary stories. I'm here to do the deal with you. But who can put a price on them? What do you want for it? You've overpriced it. I'm offering you 50. You don't want 50? My final offer would be... Four top dealers do battle when Four Rooms returns. Next Wednesday at 8 on Four. In the concluding part of this film, we feature disturbing and distressing descriptions and images of conflict. We return to Sri Lanka's killing fields, war crimes unpunished. As the truth emerges about the end of the Sri Lankan civil war, questions grow about how the world let it happen. The answer lies in the secretive world of international diplomacy. In the Sri Lankan capital of Colombo on the 29th of April 2009, with the war in the north still at its height, the then British Foreign Secretary David Miliband arrived for talks with the Sri Lankan Foreign Minister Rohitha Bogalagama. The atmosphere appeared cordial enough, but leaked evidence shows what David Miliband actually thought of the Sri Lankan government. He said they were liars. 
His words were reported in this secret cable from the U.S. Embassy in Colombo to the U.S. State Department in Washington. His comment was undiplomatic, but the evidence suggests accurate. And that lying, he now implies, had a calculated purpose. There was a propaganda battle clearly taking place in which it was very important for uh, the Rajapaksi government to insist on the whiter than white nature of its own uh, approach. Uh, in order to get through this final phase, the final weeks, or ultimately days, of the war. The Sri Lankan government was prepared to tell the world whatever it took, no matter how outrageous, to buy time to physically finish off the LTTE and continue, as the evidence suggests, the premeditated targeting of Tamil civilians. Sir John Holmes, here meeting President Rajapaksa in Colombo, was the head of the UN's humanitarian operations at the time. The accusation against the UN and against the international community is that basically the Rajapaksa regime ran rings around you. It gave you assurances that weren't true, it told you barefaced lies, and continued on doing what it was doing. Well, I think that's largely true, that they, they did make promises which they didn't keep, and they did do what they intended to do all the way through, which is to finish the LTT off militarily, no matter what it cost, including in civilian lives. They didn't believe that anybody in the international community was prepared to stop them, and they were right. Even where there was sympathy for the beleaguered Tamil civilians, in a world still dominated by the rhetoric of the war on terror, there was apparently no will to do anything for them. A lot of governments including the Indian government, because of their own huge Tamil population, wanted to show concern. At the same time, there was a sort of implicit green light um, for the government to finish off the LTT. There were a lot of people, a lot of countries around the world, who were actually probably happy to close their eyes and just have the LTT dealt with. There was a bit of a diplomatic dance around, around all this, with everybody knowing that the, the end of this was was going to be an inevitable military victory of the, the government uh, and the inevitable defeat of the LTT. And it was a question of waiting for that to happen, hoping it happened as quickly as possible, and that it happened with as few civilian casualties as possible. So that may sound a bit cynical, but that's the, the reality of what I was observing. Having won its war, the Sri Lankan government warned the rest of the world to stay out of Sri Lanka's affairs. In a keynote speech to the United Nations in New York, President Mahinda Rajapaksa insisted he would deal with things in his own way. If history has taught us one thing, it is that impose external solutions, breed resentment, and ultimately fail. Ours, by contrast, is a homegrown process. Rajapaksa, however, was quite happy to seek an external helping hand when it came to ramming home his message, as this secretly recorded conversation with an executive of the British public relations company, Bell Pottinger, reveals. We had a team working uh, in the president's office, and uh, I mean, we wrote um, uh, 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 President Reynolds Fax's uh, speech to the UN uh, last year, which was very well uh, received. That speech by President Rajapaksa was the prelude to a huge propaganda offensive designed to buy off international criticism. When our last film, Sri Lanka's Killing Fields, was shown around the world, the Sri Lankan government produced its own documentary in reply, an hour-long production called Lies Agreed Upon. Doctored footage and deliberate lies are presented as authentic. Numbers are pulled from thin air and presented as fact. Sources are not mentioned, faces hidden, voices distorted. A key element of this film was an attempt to discredit the harrowing testimony of the government doctors who had tried to tell the world what was happening in the war zone. The Sri Lankan government's film claimed the doctors had been forced to exaggerate the death toll by the Tigers and showed footage from a press conference after the end of the war at which they apparently publicly recanted. They're now free to talk. Let's listen. Yeah, we were in the LTT control area. When the LTT told us that, we have to tell, we have to do. Sometimes they are coming with a list of uh, numbers, casualty numbers and death numbers. They, they ask to give the details. Not only me, 
So how did the doctors come to make those statements? This US cable gives a clue. It reveals that after the war, the doctors, far from being celebrated as freed hostages, were arrested and held by the Criminal Investigation Division in Colombo under detention orders. We've now obtained an eyewitness account of what happened there. The doctors were told that if they did not recant, they would be imprisoned under Sri Lanka's Prevention of Terrorism Act for 18 months, then tried and jailed for several years. They were then told what questions they would be asked by planted state journalists and coached in what to say in reply. After the press conference, the doctors were taken back into custody for several weeks. Alongside that suppression of critics at home, has been a drive to discredit critics overseas, something our own team experienced when they were confronted by pro-government Sri Lankan media, including President Rajapaksa's personal media advisor at last year's Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Australia. Are you disputing that the video is real? Of course I'm disputing. I'm disputing everything. You put people in shadow, right? And you say, oh, of course, the people in shadow, they're frightened for their lives. <laughs> oh, okay. Come on. No, no, are you real? Anyway, are, you for real? Guys. are you for real? I mean, I in fact, the threat to anyone who criticizes the government is very real, as this exiled Sinhalese journalist knows only too well. If you really want to discuss the controversial issues, uh, either you have to do it by taking the risk of getting killed or being put in, uh, put in jail, or you will, have, I mean, you will be forced out of the country because up till now, more than uh, 60 journalists, Sinhalese and Tamils, have left the country. Since 2005 December, more than 26 media workers have been killed. And in the Tamil homelands of the north and east of Sri Lanka, Tamils are being brutally repressed too. Many are still denied access to their homes, and the military have commandeered land and dominate the economy. Even though we call it a post-war situation, the war policy still continues. And the war policy is to destroy the national life of the Tamil people, to militarize the Tamil areas fully, to make sure that nothing, no resistance would come against the government anymore. The Rajapaksa regime has always insisted that the findings of the Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission, appointed by the president himself, should be enough to satisfy international criticism. It has not done so. Although the commission did concede that considerable numbers of civilians died, humanitarian aid was in short supply and that many had disappeared, it exonerated the government of blame. It also avoided a decision on the video evidence of executions and failed even to mention specific incidents such as the killing of Prabhakaran's 12-year-old son. At no point did it address the issue of command responsibility for war crimes, including those we have detailed in this film. The Sri Lankan government said that the Lessons Land and Reconciliation Commission would satisfy international concerns. Has it? I don't believe that it has, either in its genesis or in its composition or in its conclusions. It's not good enough to satisfy what the UN Secretary General, as well as myself and others have asked for, which is the independent assessment of the allegations. The Sri Lankan government made a promise to the international community that it would investigate what had happened in the final stages of the war, that the LLRC would be uh, the venue, the forum, through which it would investigate these serious allegations. And now, with the LLRC's final report out, we find that the Sri Lankan government did no such thing. Combat operations in this awful bloody war finally ended in May 2009. No one knows exactly how many died in this desecrated landscape. But we do know some of the men who are responsible. President Rajapaksa and his brother Gotabaya remain in power. The men who led the bloody assault on the no-fire zone at Putamatalan have been rewarded with prime diplomatic posts. General Shivendra Silva is now at the United Nations in New York, and despite the accusations of responsibility for war crimes, 
He was briefly appointed to UN General Secretary Ban Ki-moon's senior advisory group on peacekeeping operations. Brigadier Prasanna da Silva is military attaché at the Sri Lankan High Commission in London. Most of these men now enjoy some degree of diplomatic immunity from prosecution. So has the Sri Lankan government got away with it? Or will the world yet demand justice? Those allegations shouldn't just sit on the shelf. It's the responsibility of the member states of the UN, up to and including the Security Council, but also through the Human Rights Council, to make sure that accountability is honored in deed and not just in word. The UN's failure to properly address the bloodshed, the tragedy that occurred in Sri Lanka, would seriously undermine the UN's credibility and its legitimacy as an organization that was established specifically to avoid this kind of human misery. Last week, the High Commission of Sri Lanka in London told us they categorically rejected the malicious allegations made by this program and regretted that once again, Channel 4 has not shared the video footage or any of the other material upon which it purports to have relied prior to broadcast. They also regretted Channel 4's continuing hostile and biased editorial position with regard to its reporting on Sri Lanka. And that we chose to focus attention on a number of highly spurious and uncorroborated allegations and seek entirely falsely to implicate members of the Sri Lankan government and senior military figures. The High Commission said that the channel had chosen to ignore the many positive post-conflict developments now taking place in the country and that our approach would harm the ongoing and comprehensive reconciliation process. At the end of last year, President Mohinder Rajapaksa and the Sri Lankan government delegation gathered at the 2011 Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Australia. As they quaffed champagne, nibbled canapes with other world leaders and were presented formally to the Queen, they must have thought their rehabilitation was assured. And when Sri Lanka was confirmed as the venue for the next Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in 2013, Images from the Civil War, and as many as 40,000 Tamil dead, must have seemed a distant memory. It is for the United Nations and the international community to make sure they are not forgotten. You can see the first Sri Lanka's Killing Fields program on 4OD and find out more about the devastating civil war in Sri Lanka at